Welcome to Washington Street United Methodist Church, a church with heart and the heart of the city. Whether you are a member or a new friend or a trusted old friend, we're glad you've chosen to worship with us today. We are so thankful for the many ways in which we can continue our worship experiences online at wsmethodist.org and in our outdoor services. We had our second service on October the 18th and we anticipate our third service on November 1st at four o'clock. That will be a communion service, so we will practice social distancing, and I will ask you once again to bring your elements of juice and bread from home. We will have some provided here for those of you who cannot accommodate those needs. I wanna say a special word of appreciation to our youth here at Washington Street. This week, they conducted a supply drive for our upcoming Sunday dinner on the grounds. We are so thankful for all that they did to conduct the drive and for all that you did to make it successful. We are so thankful for all the ways in which our youth and our children participate in our ministries here at Washington Street. And especially we're grateful for the ways in which you show us to be a church with heart and the heart of the city. I also want to remind those of you who are at home that our soup cellar is still in need of bottled water. That need will continue as long as we are serving in this new way uh, through the pandemic. Please bring your contributions to our Bull Street parking lot door and you can put them inside the door there and we'll make sure that they get taken to the soup cellar. We thank you so much for helping us keep our soup cellar ministry thriving during these days. Again, I want to remind you that here at Washington Street, we are connecting with our community through many ways on wsmethodist.org. We provide Sunday school classes, weeknight classes, study groups, and we also provide worship. I hope you'll join us for these many opportunities to connect in serving God, learning about God, and praising God together. Let us worship the Lord. And now, if you would join me in the opening prayer, let us pray. Loving God, you not only welcome us, you receive us into yourself. Give us courage to be so open to others, to let them become so dear to us that we might share not only your gospel, but also our lives through Christ, who makes room for us all. Amen.
Our Old Testament reading this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently, Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for all your bountiful mercies, the, the things that you provide for us, whether we pay attention or not. Changing leaves, the changing of the seasons, 
the warmth of the sun and the cool of the wind and the beauty of the stars and the moon. Lord, we thank you for your care for us that you gave us such diversity in the world. Uh, you also gave us a diversity of people, people who uh, think differently, believe different things, look different, and act different. But Lord, we are all your beloved children and you love us each equally. Help us to remember that and to love all those that we come in contact with. Lord, we ask you to watch over our teachers and our students as some are going back to face-to-face -face classes if they have not already been there. We ask you to protect them all and give them the peace that passes understanding as uh, they try to learn and teach in difficult circumstances. And sustainer God, please send your healing mercies to those who are sick in body, sick in mind, or sick in the spirit. Fill us all with your love and peace. In the precious and holy name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And now, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew. I'm reading verses 34 through 46. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the spirit calls him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On a road trip long, long ago, my family and I fell in love with an audio book from a new series titled, A Series of Unfortunate Events. Today's text brings us to the final question in a series of questions between Jesus, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. It happened on a Monday a very particular Monday, the Monday after Jesus's triumphant entry into Jerusalem, the Monday before he was crucified on Friday. They came at him with questions about Caesar and paying taxes, about the intricate marriage laws within Jewish practice, 
asking, after seven brothers marry the same woman, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? But when Jesus is asked his final question, he, answers to, he asks his own question about the Messiah and whose son he is. Quoting Psalm 110, he poses his final question to the Pharisees. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? With just one question, Jesus exposed their lack of understanding of who the Messiah, the one they long awaited for, was to be. He was not merely to be a son of David. He was to be a son of God, worthy of the title Lord. In just that one question, Jesus subtly claims his authority as the Messiah, the Son of God, and his authoritative interpretation of the law. His answer to their final question about the most important commandment is central to Christian thought and practice. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, he said. He told them the Shema, just what they expected to hear. And then he added from the book of Leviticus, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Earl F. Palmer wrote, Sometimes the gospel provides a people with a powerful answer to difficult questions. Sometimes the gospel provokes people to even deeper questions. Jesus' response to the Pharisees' question provokes us to even deeper questions. What does it mean to love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind? What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Religious folk might say that loving God means keeping the Sabbath day holy. Others might think about attending worship services in non-COVID times, of course. Some people might use a well-used but often misunderstood phrase, being born again. We can begin to list a number of phrases or words that people might associate with what loving God really looks like. Prayerfulness, spiritual awareness, some might say humility or kindness or gentleness, compassion or forgiveness. And as we listen to that list, we recognize that very soon we begin to name things that shift us from God to our neighbor. Tim Beach Vichy wrote, in quoting the Shema, Jesus points out that the aim of the law is to orient us and one's entire life toward God. However, one cannot love God without loving what God loves. To love God is to love in the way that God loves indiscriminately. To love God is to love what God loves. Everything. Because God is the source of all being. And God loves all creatures. In one of my first contextual settings in seminary, 
I said something about loving my neighbor. And one of my fellow students challenged me. How will they know that you are sharing the love of God with them and not your own personal love? I can no longer rem remember how I responded, but I recall that one of my professors looked at me at the conclusion of my response and said, well, I'm happy to know that if someone invites you to chase an ideological rabbit, you can really hold your own. You know, love sounds like such a simple answer, but the complexity of what it means to love God and to love one's neighbor truly has the power to reorient one's life, to transform one's heart, and to transform the world. That power does not originate with anything that is false, but only with that which is pure and springs from the very heart of God. Sometimes love does not look like gentleness and kindness. Sometimes it looks like asking the even deeper questions of faith and of life. Today is Reformation Sunday, when Protestant denominations remember the bold action of Martin Luther, a Catholic monk serving as a professor of moral theology at Wittenberg University. In 1517, he nailed 95 theses regarding the selling of indulgences, primarily, to the doors of the churches of Wittenberg, most famously to the door of All Saints Church. He meant his actions to be a simple invitation to dialogue, but it raised deeper questions. And it became a catalyst for the Protestant Reformation. His theses were nailed to a closed door, but they opened the door to a theological debate that literally changed the shape of Christian doctrine, thought, and practice for generations. When we ask the deeper questions about what does it mean to love God, to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and what does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself, we sometimes find ourselves wrestling with the same principalities and powers that Jesus faced in his day. In that 22nd chapter of Matthew, Jesus was caught up in questions of authority and power, religious laws and politics. And each of those forces were entangled in the events that happened between that glorious Sunday and that dark Friday. Unfortunately, Many of them were dressed in the rubrics of religion. Richard Rohr wrote in his devotion titled, An Agreed Upon Devotion. Both Thomas Aquinas and C.S. Lewis taught that the triumph of evil depends entirely on disguise. Our egos must see it as some form of goodness and virtue so that we can buy into it. If evil depends on a good disguise, cultural virtue and religion are the very best covers of all. The series of questions that are found in the 22nd chapter of Matthew exposes the good disguise of cultural virtue and religion in the time of Jesus. While Rome held the political power the Pharisees and the Sadducees held the religious power over the everyday lives of people of faith. They did not represent the best of Judaism, which is good, but the worst of humanity. They used their power and influence, their knowledge of the Torah, and their leadership to reduce faith 
to a series of right and wrong answers, right and wrong behaviors, so that religion itself became an authentic expression of life with God. But in their final exchange, Jesus, the Son of God, reiterated that life with God is grounded in love. God's indiscriminate, unconditional love for humanity and human beings' capacity to love one another. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. With this declaration ringing across the streets of Jerusalem and bouncing across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, sounding from the palace of Herod to the fortress of Pilate, from the house of Caiaphas to a hill called Golgotha, from a burial place to an empty tomb, Jesus showed us that love wins. Love overcomes death. Love conquers evil. Love exposes the deception of false religion, broken systems, injustice. And love beckons us to ask the deeper questions of what it means to love God and to love our neighbor. As we struggle with the deeper questions, as we strive to live in the way of Jesus, we will witness the transforming power of love in our lives and in the world. Paul wrote to the church at Rome, let love be genuine, hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I think Jesus might have phrased it differently. Overcome evil with love. So be it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The psalm says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus said that all of the law hangs on those two commandments, to love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. As we depart from worship today, we go into the world knowing that God goes with us, lighting our path with the law, the Torah, the prophets, the gospels, and the writings of the prophets and the apostles. God goes with us to light the way so that we might love God and love our neighbor in the name of Jesus Christ. Go then, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.